So you can type space filter, and then I think it's a colon, and then a quote, um, and then the square bracket. This is kind of annoying, right? So go to search right here, and what do you want to search for? You want to search for summer. Okay, yeah. so hit advanced search, which is the little button right there, I think. Yep. And search for filter. Okay, so now type a filter expression. Um, so put in it's square bracket tag, square bracket summer, mm -hmm. and two closed squares. No matches. So nothing's tagged to summer. Uh, apparently tag not. something else. Put something else in there. Then you think something's a tag. To. There we go. So copy that filter. Copy that. Do you have a clipboard buffer? You know what a clipboard buffer is? Yeah, doesn't it grab a lot of your uh, copies and hold them? Yeah, it allows you to do copy, copy, paste, paste. Yeah, we, we tried this out in COM 106. Many times. You need a clipboard buffer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So go to um, hyperplants now. Go to hyperplants? Yeah, you can close summer because summer's not going to work with this tag. You just get this yeah, exit out. Yeah. Go to hyperplants. There, let's edit this. And, and um, top line, we're just going to mess around. Put an HR, yeah, I like an HR so I can tell what I'm doing. So close the HR and angle brackets. Your tag. Yeah, there you go. And then call them um, the very beginning of that line. Open it with double angle brackets. List hyphen and space and then filter colon. Oh, that's a send. Colon quote. And then at the end of the line. And close angle brackets. Okay, so none of them probably have embeds, right? So let's go. So okay, it's so the hide the preview or, or save the tip, save it, and let's go to find me. That's first, and let's edit the tip. Book. And um, so where'd you get that? The photo? Yeah. I found it on the internet. Yeah. Um, so it's from. So let's just let's just get get an embed code for that by going to um, Flickr and searching for binding. Or any place that will give you that code. But, yeah. You can look at your brain there to find me. Isn't that cool? Probably images would be bad, but either way. See what happens. Mm -hmm. Waiting for cash. Beautiful. So share this if it's shareable. Um. Right there. Right there behind right here. the pictures. Yeah. I'm trying to grab it. Oh. I've got video in the way. Yeah. And it gives you an embed code. I even do a thumbnail, for example, right? Whatever. That's just the thumbnail. See what happens. And um, copy, paste into hyperplanes under in the field embed. Create a new field for the tiddler binding. Scroll down. Scroll down. Not there. You go. Embed. And 
now, nothing's different in bind read, but what should be different? Which tibble? Hyperplans. Ooh, there it is. <laughs> Ooh. Why is it at the bottom? Because I just edited it. Yes, because it's being sorted by modified. Mm. So you might want to sort it alphabetically or something. How oh, do you change that? All right. Yeah. Um, all right, edit the filter. Where did I put that filter? It's in your um, advanced search, I think. Yeah. Um, inside that first, that last bracket, um, inside the last, there you go, one more over, over. There you go, right in there. Um, type sort, um, open bracket, um, modify, and close bracket. And put a exclamation point in front of sort, which will reverse the order of the sort. Copy that filter to your the quotes. Don't, don't, don't lose your quotes. Don't lose You have to get that last bracket. There you go. Paste. There you go. So advanced search is a way to build filters so you get them just right and then you copy and paste your filter inside code. Okay, now Hannah you're saying this is a lot of coding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not that much. It really, it really, it, and the uh, what your what the skill that it's teaching you is to see a little bit of that code. It's pretty light, but you can do amazing things with it. So um, the only thing I haven't figured out yet um, here is how to get rid of those stupid bullet points because you don't want them to list that way. Yeah. But when you click on it, it takes you there. So now you can imagine like a set of thumbnails, right? In an eight by eight square. All thumbnails, and you can just click on them and we'll take you there. That'd be beautiful. That would be beautiful. That's weird. It takes me to a, a different photo because that's the way I did it. What does it do? It takes me to this. Well, it so takes you to that tiddler. Yeah. Oh, edit the tiddler. And um, instead of get rid of that, keep that there. Yeah, I want to keep that. Yeah, put it on top of center. Return, return, and transclude the value of embed for the current tizzler. Okay. Um, so you keep, no, oh, oh, excellent, excellent, except the only thing you're missing is telling it the current tizzler. What's that? Which is that. So what you've done is transclude, you hear transclude, you think curly braces, you think current tizzler, double exclamation points. And the name of the field, and it puts the value of that field in that spot, which is kind of powerful. When you begin to think about these things in terms of designing and writing an interactive text, your tiddlers become these objects, and you have to think about how what they look. Um, so that's yeah. And you could also instead of calling it embed, you call it thumbnail. And then you can have, you can, do you, you want to see how to do that? So let's go back to your, what time is it? I have two more minutes before you have to leave, right? 12. I thought you had to leave at 11.30. I have a class at 12, so. You feel, I thought you were leaving at 11.30. No, I'm Okay. What, wait, what time? So, yeah. we'll say how to do this. Go to your, the template that you opened with the code, the macros. Mm -hmm. the macros. I may have, I shut that. What's that called? And they're hard to find because I named them that. Um, they're not, they have to show up in recent. That's annoying. Yeah, it is. Hit more. Hmm. And do all. And they have to show up because there's a dollar sign thing, whatever. 
play. So annoying. So I tag, I tag them design right macros. So search for design right macros. This is cap sensitive, isn't it? I don't know. Space macro. No, that's so annoying, isn't it? Hmm. Um, go to high. I find it. Um, look for shadows. Back to my. It's called list modified and it's a shadow. List modified. See the, actually, if you're great messing with lists over, <laughs> so go back to playground, you can get a list of, and drag that into your week. I don't think it dragged. Oh, did it. There you go. That'll be a link to it. There. Sorry, that's one way to do it. Also, oh, edit this. Copy list embeds. Mm. It doesn't matter. Anyone. Any of them. Copy the whole from the define to the end. Copy and paste at the top. The top of this? Yeah. A couple returns in there. Yep, paste. Okay, now let's change the first captions to thumbnails. And the first caption down here, the field type, the thumbnail. Okay, save. Congratulations, you just made a ma uh, macro. Edit, find, read. Um, no, actually, edit tiger plants. That's where you're using the macro. Change embeds to thumbnails. Change the field. Change the edit hyper plants. Change the macro you're calling from embeds to height to thumbnails. Save it. Okay, it's not calling it. Why? Edit bind weed. And create a new. And you can't edit the name of the field. So create a new field, thumbnails, and get the cop the value from above. There you go. Just copy the whole thing, copy paste, and go back to your um, Flickr and do an embed larger now to square. Copy that and paste that in the embed field. No, no, not right. No, no, no. Down in the field, the value of embed. You have to replace it with a new there. Hmm. And uh, I think that's you known as edit. That's a square one as opposed to the thumbnail? Yes. Okay, see? So yeah, and do the same repeat embed. But this field should be thumbnail, not thumbnails. So, you, yeah. Should I destroy that? Yeah, I think it. You might want to trash thumbnails. Yeah, and then up here, let's see if they look different. We've got embed, do the same thing for thumbnail. beginning to build a different, your text is going to look differently depending on context. Um, yeah, that's neat. And it gives you a lot of power as a writer. Um, so we're doing things with pictures which people get kind of intuitively, but they can also be different words, like that poem that we saw for writing. So for, if you were writing something about, you know, anything, you might have a, um, well, let me give you an example. So. Years ago, in graduate school, 
um, with my colleagues, we, we created something we were calling the Flexible Gazette. Okay, it was a news service, and this was before online news, so it was imaginative. So the news service would come down and you would select, well, am I a liberal or a conservative? If you select liberal, the news would, you know, within the text of the news, it would sort of transclude liberal code words into the news. But if you selected conservative, it would transclude conservative code words into the news. So you could have the same news source, but, but um, bias it based on the language you used. You could build that into Tiddly Wiki by having conservative verb, liberal verb. So you might say, you know, da 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 da, Justice Scalia transclude conservative verb or liberal verb, and it would put a different verb there depending on how you, what you as a reader asked for. So you can do the same thing with words. You can put different values of, of fields or tiddlers or objects, however you want to do it. You can push different values to be displayed to your readers depending on choices that they've made or that you've made for them. So someone who's coming, say that someone who's coming to your news site from foxnews.com, I say, hey, that person's a conservative. I'm going to send them the conservative interpretation so that they'll keep coming back and seeing my ads. And if they're coming to you from MSNBC, oh, they're probably liberal. So we're going to show them the liberal version of the news so they'll keep coming back and generating ads. And because it's a transclusion, your readers would never know. If you made links, they might then they make some choices. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, that's kind of wacky, that flexible gazette, isn't it? Yeah, I like it. But you could, you could imagine doing that with a poem. You could do that in this class. You could take any news story and hypertextualize it by maybe you could even get the, the coverage of the same news story from Fox and from MSNBC and kind of blend them and hypertextualize it so that the two news stories you can shape the way that the news stories are delivered. That would be a project that would be interested in this class. Um, you could do a poem that might, um, depending on the time of day, you might have different words if the person is reading it in the morning versus reading it at night. I, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I mean, but that's like a, that's art, <laughs> right? Because the idea is that there's a, your the text is interactive, and you think you you think interactive means interacting with the reader, but it can interact with all sorts of things. It can interact with what you know about the reader, or it could, it could be random. So you could say, you know, depending on the hour, if you come into my text at nine, it's going to read this way. If you come in at eleven, it's going to read this way. That would confuse the hell out of your readers. <laughs> James is saying. Why? <laughs> no, no, no. And I'm saying, yeah, that's cool because it's, wouldn't it be cool? And what would be a practical application of that? Just? For changing the text depending on the time. The text being the whole, not the actual text you're reading. The text is the whole of the object that you're looking at. You know, my definition yeah. of text. What would the practical application of changing the text depending on time? Have you ever seen that on the web? You see it in Yelp. You guys use Yelp? You don't use Yelp? Yelp is a recommender service. You search for restaurants, yeah. and, and it tells you whether they're open or closed now. There's not somebody going into the website saying, we're closed now, <laughs> right? They have their hours, and they display a text open or closed now, depending on, yeah. So that's a practical use. Less practical might be a poem that has different words depending on the time of day, but the poets would find that interesting. You're not a poet. You're not a poetry reader much, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. But the beautiful thing about Tiddlywiki is it satisfies James's instinct to deliver text to people at a practical level, say, when are the hours that are open and what's happening now? And maybe Hannah's instinct is a poet. Do you write poetry? No. <laughs> Can you just say yes? Yes. <laughs> Hannah's interest is a poet saying, I want to write this interactive poem that that interacts, it's a performance piece in a sense, that interacts with my audience. Performance poetry. Have you taken creative writing here? Yeah. 
Would this idea of creative writing fly in that class? You Depends on the professor. That. Depends on the professor. I'm going to introduce this to creative writing professors. I think my, my links to hypertext fiction are really interesting. Did you ever read any hyperfiction? Do you read fiction at all? Or? Yeah, a lot. You read a lot of fiction? Just books, right? No. <laughs> Link stuff. <laughs> Why? Why do you only read sequential fiction and not hypertextual fiction? Well, personally, I just like reading out of books better than online, screen, or whatever. So you like paper reading better than yes. screen reading? Yeah. So, so yeah. Would you could you imagine a way to um, satisfy your hypertextuality drive by reading on paper? Huh? Like how could you create paper that was hypertextual? Well, you could say jump to this page for a different ending. So okay, we could we could we could hard code links into the text of the book, saying go to page nine. Yeah. If you like when this, go to page seven. Okay. Yeah. When uh, I was a kid, I used to read those goosebumps with multiple endings, and those were fun. <laughs> I travel with toys, if not laptops, right? So here's a hypertextual book, oh, right? Have you seen this? Did I've you seen see this last like week? That. So, um, and then here's another hypertextual book. This is Nelson's Literary Machines. And he's got a picture in here about how to read the book. And I'll put this on. So he's got three chapter ones, four chapter ones, one chapter two, and four chapter threes. And he says you should read the book sort of in this sequence to understand it. You keep circling back to the beginning and keep circling back to the end. So you, you can build instructions inside of a book, but that would be one way. What would be another way to hypertextualize a printed book? You can shred it and string threads through it like potatoes. I like that. <laughs> shred the book and then put them in order. Well, not randomly. Change the order and then give that book to someone else. But that book would make no sense. Okay. Wait, wait, why would you think that book would make no sense? Or it wouldn't give the same message that the author. Okay, well, that's an entirely <laughs> different story. It wouldn't give the same message that the entire thing. Yes, hypertext, when you allow readers to rearrange the sequence of objects, if you think of a narrative of a book as a sequence of objects where each word is an object and the author chooses to put them in this order. Right? You could change as a reader, as a writer, the authors made those choices about what words and what order. And every word's a tiddler. What if you were able to globally change all of the names of the main character from Fred to Theodore and then print the book? That would be one very simple hypertextualization of a book, and then you printed it on demand. So you would modify the text and print and then read. So the contents would be different based on what you, the reader, chose, but you could still read on paper. Okay. And then when you didn't like that version, you'd have to print it again. So it's all because you want to read on paper instead of on the screen. Okay. So you have so it allows you to interact with the text but only in one version at a time. You can't craft a new version. You could read a page, decide what to do next, look at the page, click the link, print the next page, read the page, and print it one page at a time. All right, that's absurdly annoying. So, um, we don't do much, we don't create many printed hypertexts. Um, Although some would argue, and this is, we're going to have to end the class with this thought because it's too obscure to go on. Some would argue that all of the newspapers in the world, all of the media sources in the world, all the reporting in the world are reflecting reality, and they're sifting through their pieces of reality, crafting it, and 
producing the daily newspaper and print for you and said, this is my picture of reality, the New York Times. Here's my picture of reality, the Schenectady Gazette. And they're the same, they're looking at the same worlds, but they're making different choices. So if you think of it, that, say I told you it was way too philosophical. To, it's just different perspectives. I like it. Then, right? yeah. But it's a way of thinking of, of how we generate hypertext and, you know, it's all the world of giant text. Back to your tippy wiki. Let's look at our little teeny world, our 16 objects, our 64 objects, and um, think about making those.